Pathfinder Award is given to individuals who have made a significant contribution to the education, research, and support of men and their families while dealing with prostate cancer. Previous recipients, some of whom are even in the room here tonight, include Bob Scheel, founder of Prostate Calgary, Dr. Brian Donnelly, Dr. Siraj Hussein, Dr. Dean Ruther, Dr. Nicole Coolis reed Dr. Shelley Spanner, and Stuart Campbell, former chairman, Prostate Calgary Society. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure that Prostate Calgary recognizes Dr. Jeff Gatto for his leadership and contributions to research and support of men and their families. Dr. Gatto is a urologic oncologist and a clinical associate professor in the departments of surgery and oncology at the University of Calgary. He is the director of the University of Calgary Urologic Oncology Fellowship. He specializes in the management of prostate, bladder, and kidney cancer, and has expertise in open laparoscopic robotic surgical techniques. He completed his undergraduate and residency training at the University of British Columbia. He is a Westbrook Scholar, which is the university's most prestigious designation. He received the Hamber Scholarship in Medicine after graduating top of his class. Dr. Gatto went on to complete a fellowship in urologic oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and obtained his Master of Public Health at Harvard. And it goes on. He's a national key opinion leader in the field of urologic oncology and currently sits on the medical advisory board for Kidney Cancer Canada and Bladder Cancer Canada. Dr. Gatto has served on the scientific program committee for the Canadian Urological Association, CUA, and was named a CUA scholar. He is the medical director of the Clinic for Advanced and Metastatic Prostate Cancer, better known as CAMP, at the Prostate Cancer Center. He is the surgical outcomes leader for the Southern Alberta Institute of Urology. He is frequently asked to review submissions for a number of academic journals and has an impressive number of peer-reviewed publications. He's been invited as a speaker at local, provincial, and national conferences. We had the privilege of having him speak at our symposium. He has received numerous teaching awards for, from the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary and has received the Star Educator Award from the Department of Surgery. So it's no wonder that we're honored to be able to recognize Dr. Gatto as a true pathfinder. Dr. Gatto, it's up to you. Thank you for the very warm introduction. It's uh, really an, an honor to be here and uh, to be recognized with this award and uh, follow in the footsteps of uh, some of the other recipients that, that have been mentioned, uh, including uh, Dr. Donnelly, one of my mentors. So uh, really, really, it's an honor to be here and. Uh, to uh, to be involved with this organization and and to look after some of you as patients and uh, yeah to have been invited to speak um, at some of your events in the in the past and yeah just uh, really truly an honor and uh, yeah fortunate to be uh, invited back to give uh, another uh, another talk and uh, this one uh, uh, Brad had uh, mentioned would be uh, of particular interest to uh, to the group. Uh, it's certainly an area uh, that's uh, changing uh, quite quickly, and uh, I think uh, it gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the work we've done at the Prostate Cancer Center, and specifically some of the trials that we've been involved with, and that some of you have been involved with, and, and talk about the impact that those uh, trials have had, uh, not just locally on uh, on our patients, but uh, globally. So. Yeah. Uh, these are just some of my disclosures, um, and uh, 
just mentioned there that, uh, as Brad mentioned, I've been a principal investigator for uh, several clinical trials in advanced prostate cancer over the years, and some related to the topic tonight, metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer would include the Titan trial, uh, Enzymet, uh, and then some of our current trials, Amplitude and Talapro, which are looking at uh, PARP inhibitors uh, in this space. Uh, and then a, the prevalence study, which is a genetic study that we're working on uh, currently. So I'll uh, start just by uh, going over uh, briefly the metastatic castration uh, sensitive prostate cancer landscape uh, and explaining what that is and uh, how it's defined and uh, how we uh, select treatment options based on uh, where people fall within uh, this, uh, this uh, disease space. So metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer, MCSPC, or hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, as some would refer to it, uh, can be defined uh, as de novo, meaning it's newly diagnosed. Patients show up with metastatic prostate cancer. They don't have a previous diagnosis. They weren't treated with surgery or radiation years prior. Uh, or a recurrent uh, metastatic castration-resistant sensitive prostate cancer uh, following local primary therapy. And so you can uh, see in this, oh, you can see there. Probably can't read that very well from the back of the room, I'm imagining, but the metastatic castration sensitive uh, disease uh, space is, is here. Uh, and there are many ways uh, or some ways to get there. Uh, I, I mentioned that you can either show up with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer, or you can start out with localized disease and uh, maybe progress after treatment with surgery or radiation and uh, develop uh, local regional disease uh, that eventually becomes metastatic. Uh, the majority of patients uh, that we see with metastatic prostate cancer actually do uh, present with local disease prior to their diagnosis. Um, that's you know probably changing over the last decade to some degree. It's still the majority of patients, but I think with uh, decreases in PSA screening, um, 10 years ago, we're, we, we are seeing more patients showing up with metastatic prostate cancer. There's several studies that, that, uh, that have shown that. Um, and that's unfortunate because we do have a window of opportunity to cure prostate cancer uh, prior to uh, metastatic involvement. Uh, so some of the other uh, classifications that we look at with uh, metastatic castration sensitive uh, prostate would include uh, volume and risk criteria. So high volume versus low volume uh, metastatic prostate cancer uh, refers to some criteria that were outlined in the, the charted trial, which is a trial looking at treatment intensification with chemotherapy, uh, first uh, published back in 2014, uh, that chose to define uh, patients as high volume if they met certain criteria. They basically had to have uh, one of the uh, two uh, criteria, one being four or more bone metastases with at least one outside of their pelvis or uh, vertebral column, uh, or uh, visceral metastases, meaning lung or liver or other solid organ uh, tissue metastases. So that was the criteria used in the charted trial. The other definition that you'll hear thrown around is the risk categorization as either high risk or low risk, and that came about from the latitude trial, uh, as well as the stampede uh, trial, which defined high-risk patients as those who had at least two of the three criteria that are listed here, uh, those criteria being uh, three or more bone metastases anywhere uh, in the body, uh, visceral metastases, and a Gleason score of eight or higher. So you had to have basically two of those three things to meet the, quote, high-risk criteria. So as you can imagine, there's many high-risk patients who would also be categorized as high volume and, and vice versa but there are uh, certainly some high-risk patients that don't meet high-volume criteria. So uh, important in this uh, treatment space is to recognize that the extent of disease, whether you use definitions of high-volume or high-risk, um, really uh, d d does dictate to some degree how patients do in terms of response to treatment uh, and ultimate outcomes, including survival. Uh, we know that more advanced disease tends to progress more quickly and uh, has worse outcomes even with uh, optimization and intensification of, uh, of treatment. This is uh, some data just showing uh, some survival curves, which you're all familiar with, uh, overall survival curves for patients based on their risk uh, category uh, and whether or not they're de novo or um, recurrent or relapsed. So uh, prior treatment, low volume metastatic prostate cancer, prior treatment, high volume, de novo, 
metastatic low volume and de novo metastatic high volume, you can see that the, the patients who've had prior treatment uh, and are low volume at presentation do much, much better than the patients who show up with de novo disease uh, that's high volume, if that makes sense. Basically speaks to the fact that we want to find this cancer early, treat it early. Um, even within metastatic disease, there's early and there's late. And uh, yeah, you want to find it earlier rather than later. Uh, so there remains an opportunity to maximize uh, treatments uh, for these patients, uh, whether that's delaying progression to castration resistance or, uh, or need for chemotherapy, uh, prolonging overall survival. Uh, and preserving quality of life is really another one of our uh, key uh, outcome measures. We know that uh, even with uh, the current standard of care in this disease space, uh, treatment intensification with AR pathway inhibition, which we'll talk about, uh, or docetaxel with uh, ADT, uh, most patients will progress to metastatic castration-resistant disease within two to three years. So that's with optimal treatment. Uh, this is actually my favorite slide of the, the presentation because it sort of out, outlines how things have changed over my career. Yeah, I started in Calgary in 2011, and uh, these trials or some of the early trials were ongoing at that time, and we didn't actually have the data. And so really when I started, which wasn't that long ago, the, the standard of care for these patients was really still um, just androgen deprivation therapy without any kind of treatment intensification. And then over my relatively short career, uh, 11 years thus far, uh, we saw multiple trials uh, published uh, looking at treatment intensification, uh, several of which we were involved with locally at the Prostate Cancer Center. Um, the first trial, uh, which we were not involved with, uh, was a charted trial, uh, and that was a chemotherapy uh, intensification trial looking at docetaxel uh, being used in combination with androgen deprivation therapy uh, published back in 2014. And really, uh, since that time, uh, we've learned that treatment intensification improves outcomes. The data from the charted trial really showed us that uh, adding chemotherapy to high volume metastatic um, castration sensitive uh, patients uh, improved overall survival by over a year, uh, which is uh, pretty uh, impressive when you look at uh, some of the uh, outcomes of prior trials in castration resistant disease and other spaces where you know, we were looking at three or four month benefits as being highly sig significant clinically. Uh, so early, early use of intensification with docetaxel really did seem to, to provide optimal outcomes. And that data was uh, sort of supported by the Stampede trial uh, published the following year, looking at, again at docetaxel as intensification. Uh, and then came all these oral therapies, the AR pathway inhibitors, uh, and then those, uh, those treatments used in, in intensification in the hormone sensitive space after they had been established as uh, new standards of care in, in the castration resistant space. And those include uh, abiraterone, enzalutamide, and then uh, later apalutamide, apalutamide as well. And uh, yeah, locally we were involved with the Titan trial uh, as was mentioned previously, and then the Enzimit trial as well. Uh, and that uh, study has been updated recently. We'll go over some of that data. And then most recently, uh, we've uh, seen data from some uh, trials, Aerosens and Peace one looking at what's called triplet therapy, uh, which is uh, intensification of patients with more than one uh, line of uh, treatment. So meaning that they get ADT or androgen deprivation therapy, uh, chemotherapy, and also AR pathway inhibition with an oral therapy. And so that's the, the latest thing that we'll, we'll talk about. So again, all of this has happened over a, a relatively short period of time, less than 10 years, so kind of exciting. Now we'll talk about a uh, combination of uh, ARATS and ADT. Uh, ARATS stands for androgen receptor axis target um, and ADT uh, with docetaxel in this space. So that's you know, basically triplet therapy and the rationale for it and, uh, and some of the data that's come out uh, so we know from the charted trial, which I referenced previously, again, published first in 2014, uh, that as I mentioned, docetaxel improves overall survival significantly in high volume patients with metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer with an overall survival benefit of over a year, which, which is highly impressive. 
we know that that data, when you contrast it to the use uh, of docetaxel in the castration resistance space, where you only see a benefit uh, of a few months, suggests that early treatment is better. So early initiation of chemotherapy is better than, than waiting until patients are castration resistant. These are some of the data from some of the other um, intensification trials. So uh, we have uh, the docetaxel uh, data from the charted trial uh, here. And then, uh, as I mentioned later on, looking at AR pathway inhibition um, as opposed to chemotherapy. Uh, so oral agents like abiraterone studied in the latitude trial, apalutamide in the Titan trial, and enzalutamide in the Enzymet trial. Uh, basically showing that all three of these oral therapies or AR pathway inhibitors showed you know, similar uh, benefit in terms of overall survival uh, when started early uh, in the metastatic castration sensitive uh, space. And all these trials had various nuances to them, uh, whether they included you know, only de novo patients or they included uh, recurrent patients, uh, whether they included you know, mostly high risk patients, for example, in the, the latitude trial or, or more on all comer populations. So uh, the Titan and Enzymet trials, which, which included you know, patients really regardless of high risk or high volume. I'll pause there, I think there was a question. Yes. <laughs> um, so ba basically, all all uh, four um, uh, graphs here are, are using uh, overall survival on the vertical axis, and then months in the horizontal axis, and we're seeing uh, overall survival over time. And all four, the top is the the treatment arm. So in this case, docetaxel uh, versus placebo. In this case, abiraterone versus placebo. In this case, apalutamide versus placebo, and in this case, enzalutamide versus sort of placebo, but not really. We won't get into the details there, but, <laughs> but yeah. So basically, showing that um, the, the steeper the drop off, the worse patients are doing. The more patients are are dying more quickly, basically. Uh, and so you want a, a more gentle uh, curve. And so the upper curve is the the treatment arm, showing that there's a, a significant survival benefit uh, with with treatment intensification. And again, with all these trials, the, the benefit there in terms of median overall survival was over a year. So patients on average basically living at least a year more if they were treated with intensification early on. And that's, uh, that's important. I mean, the other thing to, to mention here is that um, these, these data have been out for several years now. Uh, and recently we've done several sort of what's called population-based studies in Canada. And the same thing's been done in the U.S., um, looking at uptake of these strategies and how this is kind of played out after these data were published, you know, did everyone who was uh, metastatic at presentation get treatment intensification? And if they didn't, why not? Uh, and you'd be surprised how many patients still aren't receiving treatment intensification. It's, uh, you know, up until a couple of years ago in Ontario, it was close to 50% of patients who are still receiving ADT alone, despite the overwhelming survival benefit to, to treatment intensification with these treatments, uh, especially the oral therapies, the AR pathway inhibitors, which have really minimal uh, additional toxicity or adverse events associated with them. And so that's you know, fairly disappointing. I think that's improved in the last year or two. And we have some data that uh, we're hopefully going to publish soon from Alberta showing that our uptake rates are much higher than that currently, more like 80 or 90%, maybe still not perfect. And not everyone needs treatment intensification. I mean, obviously, if you're 50 years old and have high volume metastatic disease, it's quite clear that you should be on intensification. If you're 95 years old and have one bone metastasis and multiple other health issues, you could maybe argue that um, intensification might carry more, more risk than benefit in that situation. But overall, most of us feel that over 90% of patients should be on uh, <clears throat> treatment intensification of some kind. Now, um, I mentioned all those uh, four studies there and showing similar benefits in terms of uh, overall survival. Um, none of those trials have really done like a head 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 to head comparison or a randomized comparison of you know one treatment versus the other. So we don't really have much idea in terms of which is a a better option in terms of overall survival advantage. There is some data from this sort of multi arm trial in the the UK, the Stampede trial, looking at a comparison of <clears throat> abiraterone with prednisone versus docetaxel. 
uh, as treatment intensification, so chemotherapy versus an oral agent, abiraterone, showing that the overall survival benefit was similar. So really, we, we sort of feel that any of these options is is uh, going to provide a similar benefit, whether you choose abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide or even chemotherapy. Um, the toxicities are different and tolerability and that sort of thing, but the benefit in terms of overall survival seems to be similar across the trials. So uh, one of the uh, rationales for treatment intensification, but also for what's called triplet therapy, so the addition of chemotherapy to AR pathway inhibition with ADT, uh, is that uh, prostate cancer is a heterogeneous uh, cancer, so uh, the cancer changes quickly. Um, there are different cell populations in the body. Some are uh, resistant to certain treatments and some are uh, sensitive to other treatments. And so uh, basically what's shown here really is this sort of heterogeneous uh, cell population in prostate cancer. Um, and we feel that by targeting multiple different pathways, uh, we can uh, take into account the fact that one treatment might, might not be uh, targeting every cell population uh, in the body. Uh, and there's a lot of good genetic evidence uh, of heterogeneity now within prostate cancer, even within individual patients. Uh, and different sites of metastases often show different uh, uh, tumor profiles. So if you look at visceral metastases, so like liver metastases, for example, as opposed to lymph node, or bone metastases, they can have a very different uh, profile. And so uh, <clears throat> one of the rationales for uh, triplet therapy is we're really trying to attack all these different cell populations all at the same time uh, and prevent one of those cell populations from progressing despite what we're doing. The rest of the talk, I'll just sort of touch on uh, triplet therapy, which again is ADT with docetaxel chemotherapy and AR pathway inhibition. Those are the three prongs of triplet therapy. And there are really uh, three studies that look into that uh, in reasonable uh, detail. Uh, only one of which, uh, Aerosens, uh, looking at darolutamide, uh, was sort of a pre-planned uh, triplet analysis. The other two, <coughs> Enzymet and Piece one did look at triplet therapy, but it was uh, sort of more of an, an afterthought based on uh, data presented from the charted uh, study, which showed that docetaxel was sort of a new standard of care uh, in this patient population. So uh, in the Enzymet trial, for example, where they had sought to uh, treat patients with ADT and placebo or ADT and intensification with Enzymet, they basically started to allow for uh, patients to receive early docetaxel uh, to account for the data from the charted trial I mentioned. And so in the end, about 45% of patients in the Enzymet trial ended up getting uh, chemotherapy as well. And so that provided us with some insight into what kind of benefit you might see if you gave all three, although it was not done in a randomized fashion. Uh, similar uh, piece one was a more complicated study design as a two by two factorial study design for those who are uh, interested. Uh, and basically uh, with that study, uh, they did eventually allow for inclusion uh, of uh, uh, docetaxel as a sort of a new standard of care. And that allowed for about 61% of patients in the study to receive docetaxel uh, in addition to uh, placebo or uh, abiraterone uh, as uh, treatment intensification. So that allowed for some uh, insight into uh, triplet therapy and what the outcomes might be. And then lastly, I mentioned Aerosens. This was sort of a pre-planned triplet study looking at uh, patients <coughs> with uh, metastatic CSPC uh, receiving ADT <clears throat> with docetaxel, and they were randomized to receive placebo or uh, darolutamide as treatment intensification on top of uh, docetaxel. So uh, when you look at the data, uh, sort of the patient population, the three studies are relatively similar. Uh, when we look at um, the outcomes of these studies, uh, we can see that in all three cases, there was a fairly significant improvement in what's called radiographic progression-free survival. Basically means we made your pictures look better, like your CT and your bone scan, or clinical progression-free survival, which is basically how you feel, you know, delays in uh, bone pain or symptom uh, progression with prostate cancer. Uh, but what we did see was that there was a variable effect on overall survival. So not, not all three studies showed that there was a benefit to giving three different treatments.
uh, in terms of how long you actually live. If you look at the Arisen study, which again was probably the best study design for looking at this triplet combination, we don't have data on radiographic or clinical progression-free survival as of yet. Uh, but when you look at overall survival, um, there was a significant improvement over the long term when patients were intensified with darolutamide on top of docetaxel. One important point to make there is that, uh, remember both arms in the Aerosens trial, uh, both arms received ADT and docetaxel. So what we're really seeing in the Aerosens trial is that if you're going to give someone chemotherapy on top of standard ADT, you should also give them a drug like darolutamide because it's going to improve their survival over the long term. Uh, we don't know that the opposite is true in that if you give someone ADT and darolutamide, adding docetaxel is going to benefit them. And that's important because uh, when you look, for example, at the Aerosens patient population, it was more of a broad patient population. It wasn't limited to high volume patients, uh, for example, who we know are going to benefit most from chemotherapy. So it's not totally clear uh, what role the chemotherapy had, had and how much of a role the darolutamide had and uh, vice versa. I was just going to get into some of the data from the Aerosens trial, just looking at uh, adverse events rates, really just trying to show that the uh, addition of darolutamide to chemotherapy as a triplet therapy really didn't have much impact in terms of overall uh, adverse events rates. Most patients did quite well. The treatment discontinuation rates uh, were very low, really like 10, 10 to 13 percent. Uh, and so uh, really this is a really favorable combination uh, and patients do quite well with it. When you look at Aerosens in terms of grade three and four adverse events, these are the the bad adverse events, so to speak. Uh, the rates are quite low. Probably some of the more important things to look at here, remember these patients are getting chemotherapy, so neutropenia or febrile neutropenia, the top two listed here, uh, are significant, you know, 34% uh, basically uh, for neutropenia and about 8%, 7 to 8% for febrile neutropenia. So um, docetaxel carries risk, it's, it's chemotherapy, so it's not not for everyone, and uh, patients need to be monitored uh, closely and uh, followed uh, closely by, uh, by their medical oncologist. <clears throat> this is some of the safety data from the PEACE-1 trial. Remember, this is a study looking at abiraterone and uh, docetaxel as, as uh, triplet therapy on top of ADT. Again, showing really low um, adverse event rates. Uh, some of the things that stand out would be hypertension, which we know is uh, more common with abiraterone uh, from prior studies of abiraterone. And then when you look at the ENZMET trial, uh, some of the grade three to five adverse event rates of interest, the more common ones we see, things like hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, fatigue, uh, falls, syncope, uh, are really low rates though uh, overall. So the triplet therapy seems to be relatively well uh, tolerated. And I was going to just uh, go over some of the updated uh, CUA uh, guidelines. So these are our national uh, guidelines on metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, which were just published this year, uh, really just showing that the uh, treatment options have changed uh, in this disease space. Uh, if you're diagnosed up here with uh, castration-sensitive prostate cancer, the first step is to initiate ADT, androgen deprivation therapy. In Alberta, that's typically Eligard or Firmagon. Uh, and then a uh, really multidisciplinary discussion uh, with regards to other treatment options and specifically trying to decide what patients we might consider for triplet therapy with intensification with docetaxel. Again, we know that those patients uh, are mostly going to be high volume patients. So patients who have visceral metastases, for example, or really a uh, significant burden of uh, bone metastases. Then we determine uh, who's eligible for docetaxel based on you know age, comorbidities, performance status, this sort of thing. And if you're eligible for docetaxel, then your options would include triplet therapy uh, with darolutamide and docetaxel, for example, uh, apalutamide or enzalutamide. And then in patients who have high volume disease, uh, specifically, we could look at uh, triplet therapy with abiraterone and docetaxel, for example, or abiraterone or docetaxel alone. If you're not eligible for docetaxel, typically uh, we would uh, look at treatment intensification with oral therapy alone with AR pathway inhibition. So that would be drugs, again, like apalutamide or enzalutamide. And then in those patients who have uh, higher volume disease, uh, abiraterone. And then once you're on treatment, uh, we're assessing patients, <clears throat> you know, every three months or so for 
uh, clinical progression, uh, radiographic progression, and then PSA progression. And once we see progression, then we look at next lines of therapy uh, for what, what is now castration-resistant prostate cancer. And that's a whole other talk in terms of uh, sequencing. What are you going to give someone who progresses on triplet therapy, for example? They've already had ADT, they've had AR pathway inhibition, and they've had chemotherapy, and now they're progressing. Um, obviously, the options are more limited, and, uh, so that requires uh, further discussion. And yeah, that's... Uh, that's about it. I think that's my last slide. I didn't actually make a conclusion slide, but I figured the guidelines are sort of a conclusion. Uh, but yeah, that was it. This is a short talk overview for you. <laughs> Do you have time for questions? Yeah, oh yeah, I got lots of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in intermittent ADT, this is uh, basically on and off hormonal therapy where we allow for recovery of testosterone levels uh, in between treatment. Typically is only done in patients uh, who have non-metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, so we know from some prior studies uh, dating back over 10 years ago that intermittent therapy is suboptimal in patients who have established metastatic cancer uh, on a CT or bone scan. It's not that we don't do it sometimes in patients who don't tolerate hormonal therapy well, but uh, we know that survival is better if, uh, if you receive continuous androgen deprivation therapy with metastatic disease. And so in that setting, yes, intensification. If you have non-metastatic disease, uh, then yeah, intermittent therapy um, is, uh, is a reasonable, reasonable approach. And to my knowledge, there aren't any studies that look at intensification of, of that intermittent therapy, but maybe that's something we'll look at eventually. Based on like our provincial approach and this sort of thing, cabazitaxel, which is a, a type of chemotherapy, is used preferentially in castration-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, typically, docetaxel is used as first line of chemotherapy. Um, it tends to carry less toxicities. There's more uh, hematologic toxicity um, with uh, cabazitaxel, b bone marrow suppression, and, and that sort of thing. And so it's, it tends to be used more in, in castration-resistant prostate cancer, and uh, certainly there's more data to support its use there. But. But it's a good option, like I mentioned, you know, picking treatment options and patients who progress on triplet therapy, that would be something to consider. If someone had already had docetaxel and already had AR pathway inhibition and uh, cabazitaxel maybe come up as a, a next line of treatment. Well, I can't remember if I was on the charter or stampede trial originally, but I combined ADT with docetaxel and I went uh, four and a half years off of ADT and yeah. no treatment, so yeah, 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 that's a long haul. Yeah, no, it's impressive. Yeah, yeah there's uh, there's definitely different approaches, you know, in, on an individual uh, uh, patient basis. We have patients who who do have metastatic disease who come off hormonal therapy and and do quite well. I have someone in my clinic today who's done just that, maybe against some of my recommendations, but he's done well for over a year now. And yeah, uh, that was in 2010. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, something else we're doing now, too, in um, in lower volume patients who have you know one or two bone metastases, for example, is is uh, called metastasis directed therapy, where uh, patients will have uh, hormonal therapy initially, and then radiation to their prostate, and then metastasis directed therapy, typically radiation to those bone lesions, um, and then after that treatment there's an appetite for taking those patients off of hormonal therapy to see how they do. Um, and yeah, it certainly seems like the MDT or metastasis uh, directed therapy seems to delay progression further. So in uh, recognition of the Pathfinder event, Prostate Calgary is pleased oh. to present you with the Pathfinder award, which you can display in your office. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Oh, yeah.